All right, well, here's a few news articles that I thought were interesting. The John Webb Space Telescope has taken this. This, I think, is the real picture. I thought it was an artist's conception at first. This is Fomalhaut, which is a star only 25 light years away and therefore very bright in the sky. And this is its asteroid belt. These are asteroid belts here, two asteroid belts much bigger than ours, and one of them tilted at 23 degrees relative to the other, which they are interpreting as evidence that there are planets there. So that's really very nice, I think very interesting to see that kind of detail about uh, an exo, uh, an alien system outside the United, outside the uh, solar system. So anyway, very nice to see. So Google pass keys, I don't know if anybody's tried these yet. Um, Google is the first major company to turn them on. And uh, so the idea is that you don't need to use a password at all to log into your Google account. And other companies are supposed to follow suit soon. So you turn on the Google Pass key and then you generate a, it's essentially, as far as I can understand it, it's the same as an SSH key. You, know, you can use an SSH key and then you never need to type in an SSH password. You generate a public-private key pair. You send the public key to the server. It stores your public key on the server and now you log in with the private key without sending the private key to the server. You, there's a challenge response system of some sort where you prove that you know the private key without sending it over the wire. And that's essentially what this is. And of course, you can have, since it's going to be locally on your device, then if your device has biometric authentication, like a fingerprint or a face scan, then that can be how you, so they figure if you can get into that device, that's sufficient proof that you're authorized to get in your Google account, and it will take the private key stored on that device and send it up and use it to authenticate. So um, anyway, it sounds pretty good. Um, I've seen people already say don't use it, it's no good because it doesn't synchronize properly between devices and therefore you need a different key on every device and what if you have a lot of devices. But then, I mean, this article, Dan Gooden said that if you use the, it, Firefox does not support it, Chrome does, and Safari does. And he says if you use Safari, then the Apple share will share it among your Apple devices, uh, password sharing. So anyway, um, I haven't tried it yet. It sounds interesting. I've got um, the, I've got the same concern. Interoperation between many devices. I know they're sharing my account. Um, I'm going to wait a while and see what other people experience here before I jump on it. But um, that's a, that's a good question. If you lose your laptop, yeah, then what? Um, it seems like you would need to have some emergency backup keys or like a password as an emergency backup. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I imagine they thought of that, but I don't know the answer. Anyway, that's why I'm not jumping on it. I don't want to get locked out of my important accounts, and I, I'm busy working. You know, I don't want to rock the boat with something that works. But if people check it out, let me know what happens. Um, so this is pretty awesome. You know, around here, when they, need, when they have a street and they want people to go slower, they put in a speed bump which seems like a pretty good solution, but this is an alternative. They have a sign here explaining this. This light is always red, and it's not at an intersection. It's in the middle of a block. It's always red unless it detects you coming slow enough, and then it turns green. So, and they said it's quite effective. They said it lowered the speed rapidly. People are going far too fast. Now they're mostly going the right speed. So this is like a politer speed bump where it doesn't like, uh, you know, cause your tires to bounce up and down and damage your car, but it does force you to stop if you're going too fast. That seems like a pretty good idea, but it's... People don't care. They still put donuts on the street. Well, that's true. Now, there'll be some people who drive right through the red light, and there's people who do donuts tonight. I see them all over the place. Yeah, I see that. That's right. And that's right. So, But I don't think they do it much in the daytime. Well, I did see one person doing it in the daytime. No, every, every, every morning you see the new marks on the, on the... Yeah, yeah, they do it at night. Yeah, but I mean, but I mean, that's 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 right. Uh, that's uh, I've noticed a lack of enforcement of traffic laws. Although the police do break the big chai joes up, I see those frequently in the news. Well, those we have like three hundred cars and go on for a long time. But yeah, um, realistically though, if one guy was to do some donuts for like a few minutes and then drive away, how could anybody prevent that? I mean, there's not enough time to report it and send a police car or anything. It's uh, realistically, I don't think there's anything you can do about that. Except, of course, if you have speed bumps or something. That would stop it. So this happens so many times. Whenever there's anybody out there that are really, really freaked out about accusing other people of sexual impropriety, they almost seem to be closeted, messed up people where they're doing something awful themselves or they wouldn't be so tense about it. This just seems to be amazingly true. Um, I listened to Steve Miller 
who is a bulwark. He's a never Trump Republican on the bulwark, and he's gay. And he said he was a Republican helping support Republican officials, and he read these articles, and that's why he came out of the closet. He said, I don't want to be the next Republican where it comes out that I'm gay. So I just came out. Um, and then, of course, he abandoned the party when then they went to Trump, like a lot of Republicans did, and those are the people I find the most interesting to listen to. Anyway, um, and here's another guy who's uh, trying to get underage women drunk and have sex with them, many of them, and also screaming that other people have to have better sexual morals. So it just seems to happen all the time. This, I thought, is pretty good. I've been wondering about this because uh, I'm watching with horror as the red states do more and more horrible things. So this guy made a nice map of the death zones. These are the parts of America that either allow permitless gun carry or um, basically deny women needed health care for pregnancy, which is really a lot of America going that way. It is pretty concerning. And I know there are an increasing number of people um, and or businesses and hospitals and doctors moving out of these states trying to go somewhere else saying, I can't really be a doctor here because I have to let my patients get very sick and perhaps die before I'm legally allowed to treat them and I don't really want to work under those conditions. And young people are, are choosing not to go to college here because they might get pregnant and then they'd be in trouble and so on. So it's, uh, it's very much like before the Civil War when we had slave states and free states, just a really serious difference in the laws in the states that we really can't tolerate. But that's where we're at again. Um, so DEF CON is going to have an event for large language models where people try to hack the large language models. And the way you hack them is by putting in strange prompts to try to override their security restrictions. And they're going to have examples of all of them, OpenAI, Google, Anthropic, and others. So it's basically like social engineering, um, social engineering contest because it's not exactly technical. It's all just writing sentences and paragraphs in a way that fools these. So they say it opens up, you know, hacking to a bunch of non-technical people like social engineering. It's a different kind of hacking. That's very interesting. I'd already proposed a workshop on AI there, which will be my machine learning stuff, but I'm not doing these large language models much yet, although I'll probably add a little bit of that. But this is what's called prompt engineering, which apparently is now a profession that's recognized and it has a really high, rapidly growing pay scale. They say people are paying 350 grand to get an expert in prompt engineering. So right now we're in the insane hype phase of AI. People are, crazy things are happening, like, like um, IBM canceled their hiring and said they're going to have 30% of the new staff is all going to be replaced by AI. Many companies are being, uh, some educational technology company, its stock fell by half because they said our business is threatened by ChatGBT. And uh, there was a list of professions that are going to vanish and be replaced by AI, and educational technology was number two on the list. People that write books and college exercises and stuff, we'll see. Um, it certainly is true that a whole lot of stuff could be done by large language models. Um, and so learning how to use them is super important. And I think learning to understand the underlying technology is really important, which is why I've been pushing the machine learning projects. Anyway, um, so DEF CON is going to have it. This is something I've read many times. Uh, PayPal seems to just be horrible in what they do if a bad thing happens. So here's somebody got ransomware. So then somebody did an illegal transaction on his PayPal account. So he contacted them and said, freeze the transaction. And they refused. He complained to the bank. So PayPal freezed it, and now um, freezes an account. This happened to a lot of people, like, you know, the, um, the little device for Wi-Fi device that people get, the Flipper Zero. They had they were, shipped them from wherever it's made, like Russia or something, to America, and it's, it's a hacking tool. And they, PayPal, they did it for a while, and then PayPal decided to freeze their account and just keep a million dollars or more. For, they did this a lot of people. They'll just freeze your account. Your money is trapped there. You can be running a business for a while. They'll suddenly decide overnight they don't like your business, freeze your account, keep the money, and you can't do anything. <laughs> I hear this a lot about PayPal. Anyway, um, you pretty much have to sue them. They just seem to be very outrageous about this. I mean, it would seem to me that if you decide that I no longer want you as a customer, then you would inform them, give them like 30 days to clean it up and give them their money back and say, look, here's your money back. I don't want you as a customer. Go deal with somebody else. That would seem like the right thing to do. Unless you can prove what they're doing is it's totally illegal, like violating international sanctions or something, then you probably have to seize it and give it to the government to hold. But I wouldn't hold on to money that is totally not mine. I would, I would say you either have to give it back to the customer or you have to pass it on to some legal agency and make sure they really broke a law, but PayPal doesn't seem to operate that way. 
Anyway, um, so the Russians, there were, uh, this came out a few days ago, the Russians say they want to quit using TCP IP because it's a decadent American invention. They want to have their own, and here's the secrets of the new Russian transport protocol. RUSTP and UDTP, which they claim will be 50 times faster than TCP IP. And I don't know if that's true, but it absolutely is true that you could make something faster than, um, than TCP IP. TCP IP is really old, and in particular, the congestion control and the way they handle large streams of data is not very good, so you could have a better thing. And they talk about how it's going to work. So it's uh, um, Russian Transport Protocol, RUSTP, and then UDTP, up-down transport protocol. And so this is going to be the thing they're developing. They've got a detailed technician. It also uses IP version 17. I don't know what that is. I mean, we're using IP version 6 and IP version 4 right now. And I remember when the tra transition began, I was a good advocate of IP version 10, which was a proposal which I thought would have been better, and various people did, but it didn't win. So I, I'm aware of the definitions of them up to IP version 10. The only ones that are actually used are IP version 4 and IP version 6, but there were other ones developed. I never heard of IP version 17, but there certainly are a bunch of these. So anyway, um, it's very interesting, and uh, that's what they say. It will um, go much better. It sounds like they, it supports something in the range of, um, there's a form of routing where you use a label instead of the IP address. Um, and it's much, much faster at the router level. I mean, that's why I say there are ways to improve the efficiency of TCP IP by a lot. If we could start over and update it to another protocol, we probably could make things quite a lot faster. So we'll see what comes to there. Someone says, yes, um, yes, you can use the, my machine learning projects as extra credit for any of my classes. Yeah, good. They say what? Fix a model users. Fixes a lot of users? They have a fixed amount of users. A fixed amount of users, oh. Yeah, because they have to identify, you have to get the ID first before they, they can use. So, uh, that? Well, I, that could be. I don't, I don't understand any of the details yet. But they claim it increases the data rate from Moscow to Amsterdam by three times and from Moscow to Sydney by 50 times. Yeah, because they are not that many users. Because they have to get their ID first. Well, I... I don't know. It'd be interesting to know. Uh, what notation standard does IP version 10 work against? Um, I don't remember. The main thing about IP version 10 that I recall, I pushed it for a while, was um, that the thing about it was it was a, it had an IPv6 size address, or maybe at least a 64-bit address, and it was backward compatible with IP version 4, which was the crazy thing about IP version 6. You couldn't have IP version 6 and IP version 4 devices on the same network. You have to have a separate stack, which I thought was stupid. And that's why there was an IP version 10 protocol that made a new protocol that was backward compatible with the old one, which seemed to me like a really good thing to do, but that ship had already sailed by that time. It was too late to, uh, to change it. Anyway, uh, that's enough of this. Let me stop recording this.